Hey, good morning. How are you? One person blessed. Anybody else? Hey, man, did you have a good week? I guess I'm just talking to you today, Anna. No one else is talking. Well, Brenda's talking. <laughs> it's good to see you. Are you excited? You ready to worship Jesus? Man, I... I Listen, we, we, we've been doing a lot of remodeling. So if you have to go to the restroom during church time, please don't go to the same place that you've gone for the women's bathroom because you'll run into a wall. We have shifted the door. What we did is we've gone into and we took one of our classrooms and we opened it up and we're going to take the women's bathroom and make it larger and we're taking that classroom and we're going to make it into a kind of a lounge. We're, we're also like when we have a wedding, that will be the bridal's dressing room. And so it will be just a room that uh, uh, opens the bathroom up. It's really nice. The door's much wider, so it's now handicap accessible. But it's not done. So when you go in there, it's, it's kind of messy. Okay, but, it, but we're getting there. And so we're really excited about the changes. Men's bathroom, uh, we, we went in there this week and we completely tore out all the stalls. And, and guys, it is now a one-person bathroom. Go in, lock the door, use the bathroom, come out. Teenagers, don't hang out in there for 20 minutes because I have a key and I will come drag you out. <laughs> don't go in there with your phones and play. I have, for some reason, I, I don't understand why, but teenagers at church think they have to run to the bathroom about four times in the hour and a half there at church. At school, if they're watching their best movie, they never have to run to the bathroom. But at church, it's like, yeah, I think it's the enemy just kind of poking them and, and they're not paying attention. And, and, or it's an excuse to get out of church. And if that's your reasoning, I rebuke you and stop doing it. <laughs> Go to the bathroom, get back out. Because now, boys, you have a one bathroom stall. It's locked. It's, but it's big, though. So, guys... It's now handicapped bathroom, and, and the guy's bathroom is almost done. We've painted it, and, and it's looking really, really good. I want to say thank you to Nicole and Thomas. They have spent the last three days working, working, working on that bathroom. And so I, I, Thomas said to me last night, he said, Nicole and I are the ones that have been complaining the most about the bathroom, so we should be the ones that, make, that fix them. So, uh, so the bathrooms are in a great remodel time. And it's going to take us a couple of weeks to finish it. Um, but we're putting new stalls up, all new toilets, so you don't have to fall to the ground to go to the bathroom now. So we actually have tall, handicapped toilets now. And they're not in yet, but they will be this week. So uh, I, don't you love it? You came to church so we could talk about bathrooms. <laughs> but hey, that's family, right? I mean, that's what we have to do is, is talk about the family stuff and get everything up to date. And so, uh, uh, good times. Um, wow, my daughter graduates high school this weekend. Just want you to know. And on Saturday, we're going to have a, a big graduation party at our house. And you're all welcome to come. We want you to come. Uh, bring a swimming trunk, so a swimming suit. You can swim, and uh, we'll have all kinds of food there. It starts at 1 o'clock. It's come and go as you want. And so we're just going to have a great time. So we invite the church to come to our house. We live at 500 North 26th Street. You might want to write that down if you want to come. But everyone's invited to come to her graduation party. Starts at 1 o'clock. Amen. How many of you love Jesus? Amen. Amen. We want to welcome those who are online this morning. We're so glad that you're with us. We know that a lot of you can't be here personally because you live all over the country. But we're so glad that you consider Abundant Life Church part of your home or your church home and that you join us each week. And we want to say welcome back to our online pastor. Barrett Ham is back online. He has been deployed for the last six months and um, he just flew back in. He flew in yesterday. He called me. He couldn't call me when he was leaving because where he was. They weren't supposed to tell anybody, and so he called me yesterday and said, I'm in New York City, I'm headed to Tampa, 
and I will be online tomorrow morning. So if you'll look at that camera back there and everyone say, welcome home, Barrett. We are glad you're back. Now, if you're new in the church and you don't know, Barrett is our online pastor. Um, he is in Tampa, Florida, and every service he is online, and he is there greeting all the people. When If, if you're not in church and you have to uh, uh, be online, does she want to sing with us this morning? I love it. <laughs> and so, so Barrett's been gone for the last six months. He's been deployed, but he is home now, and he's back online. So Barrett, we're glad that you're back with us, and we have missed you and prayed for you, and we're glad that you're back home. Amen. Are you ready to make some confessions? If you'll turn your, so turn your attention to the wall up here at the board, Greg's going to lead us in our confessions this morning. And so s repeat it with us and repeat it loudly. And, you know, the reason that we do confessions, let me just say this before we do this, is because the Bible says that we build our faith by hearing the word. And every confession we make comes out of the word. So faith comes by hearing the word, and hearing the word is what we need. So we're going to make our confessions. So, Greg, go ahead. Amen. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I, I am, am God's, God's child. child. I have been justified in Christ. I am confident that God will perfect the work he has begun in me. I have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. I am blessed in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing. I am holy and blameless. I have redemption. I am salt and light to the world. I am here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Father God, for your love and grace, your peace and joy. We worship you, Father. You are Jehovah, our provider, and you are Jehovah, our healer. You are my shepherd, you are my banner of love, you are my El Shaddai. We shout out this morning that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Let, let's shout that last one just one more time. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Let's stand this morning and let's worship the Lord. Thomas?
Jesus, thank you that you are our defender. Thank you that you are our king. You are Lord. You are Lord. Thank you that you heal the sick. You raise the dead. Lord, and in all of that, you care for me. You care for each person that's in this place, each person that's watching online. You care for them. Father, thank you. You know how many hairs are on their head. You know what they've gone through this week. You know the pain. You know the torment. You know the blessings. Lord, I thank you that your grace is so abundant to us. Lord, we worship you this morning. You are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords. And we honor you. We honor you, Jesus. Thank you for being in this place, for loving us. Thank you that your love is so real, it's so strong, it's so powerful. Father, your love in one moment can heal heartaches that we've suffered for years. In one moment, your love can wipe away abuse and hurt, can wipe away in one moment your love. can change our destiny, can change our direction, can change our path. In one moment, your love can bring deliverance. Father, we receive that to you from you today. Thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you for being our comfort, for being our peace, for being our joy. We honor you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Lord, we just stand in awe of your grace and your love. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just let his love soak you right now. Just as the rains came last night, some came gentle, some came hard. Just let the love of the Father rain down on you today. Let his love just soak you. Remember when we were kids, we would run out into the rain and let it just soak us. Now that we're all grown, we, we hide from the rain. Don't hide from the love of God this morning. Let his love just soak you. Let his love soak you this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We worship you, God. We stand in awe of you. And we give you praise. Thank you, God. Now that love that you're sensing right now in your heart, I want you to share it with somebody close to you. I want you to love on each other and share the hope of Jesus. Give them a hug and let them know I care about you. You're important to me. Go to somebody you don't know and introduce yourself and love on each other. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. Hey, buddy. It's good to see you. Good morning, Abundant Life. God is good. Is it cold in here to you? I'm, I'm. All right, we're, we're, we're just going to leave it alone for a minute. And now that you're sitting down, then we'll see how quick we have to turn down that air or turn up that air. Because I'm like, man, it's a little cold. <laughs> You're sweaty. Well, there's some of that we can't help. <laughs> That's just a matter of life. <laughs> um. Hey, right after church this morning, we are going to have a meeting for all of those who want to be involved in follow-up. Um, we have a new person who is going to take over our follow-up, and I'm very excited about this. Deborah is going to stand up, Deborah. Stand up. Deborah is going to take over our follow-up, and so, um, so we need people to bake bread. We need people to deliver um, packages after church on Sunday morning. And so we need you, if you were helping in the follow-up ministry, we need you to go to that meeting. If you have not helped in the follow-up ministry, but you're willing to, I need you to go to that meeting right after church. Teresa, where do you want? Right here? Just meet right over here, right after church, for about five minutes. Uh, food boxes are here. If you ordered a food box last week, it's here in the food room and after church. Make sure you pick up your food box. Um, every two weeks, come to the meeting first and then go get your food box. Yeah, because there is frozen food. So um, if you ordered, and the care closet will be open, and for the new people, the care closet is just, uh, we have clothes and toiletry items and all kinds of things that you can go into the care closet and, and rummage through them. And we take donations for the care closet of clothes and that kind of stuff. But if you bring something to the care closet, please wash it first. And, and don't bring us stuff that you would have normally thrown in the trash. Toiletry items. Yeah, any toiletry items if you're at Dollar General, because we give away a lot of stuff for people who can't afford it, cleaning supplies, that kind of stuff. And so uh, if you don't need it and you can help supply the, the care closet, help us do that. Amen. And it's right back here, and the food room is back there, and we'll give the food boxes away. Every other week, we give the food boxes out. So this week, we give them out. Next week, we will take money for the food boxes. It's $10 a box, and in that, you get about $25 worth of groceries. Always be two meats that are in there. And um, uh, they're nice boxes. If you got, we just started that. And if you got a box two weeks ago, you know uh, that week you got about thirty-two dollars worth of groceries. And this week is about mm, about twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty dollars worth of groceries. So it'll be good. Oh, if you took crates last time with the food in them, please bring them back because I didn't have any crates this week to pack them up. So we put them in bags. So that's a good deal. Wednesday night, 6.30, we are starting a new series through the summer. Um, what we're going to look at is the, the culture of God's kingdom. We, we're, we're going to begin to, what is the culture of God's kingdom? How does God function? And how many of you know however God functions is how we're supposed to function? But we can't function in his culture if we don't understand it. So on Wednesday night, we're looking at what is the culture of God. We're going to look at that all summer long and uh, just do um, an, an extensive study on the culture of the kingdom of God. And uh, I believe Jesus said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is is in heaven. 
So whatever is happening in heaven should be happening on earth. How many of you know that? But it can only happen through us, the church. So it can only happen if we function in his culture and who he is. And so we have to understand his culture. So Wednesday night, we're doing that study. study. Thursday evening with a men's recovery group at 7 o'clock. Friday evening, we have prayer at 7 o'clock. Come be a part of all of those things. You ready to give? Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Bring me those buckets. We're going to do something a little different. Thank you. I got them. The Bible says bring the tithes into the storehouse. So I'm going to have you bring them this morning. We're going to have you get a little exercise in. And we're going to bring the tithes into the storehouse. But I first want you to look at 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. You want to build your faith. How many of you know that God wants you blessed? Amen. Only six of you? Look, if you've been in this church as long as I've been in this church, you should know by now God wants you blessed. Amen. Abundantly. That's what he says. I will give you life and that more abundantly. And that's why the church is named Abundant Life, because as believers, we should be walking in abundance. Amen. All of you yes. should be walking in abundance. Yes. So 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, the Apostle John said this, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. How many people does God want to prosper? All. All. What's the requirement to, to prosper? It shows you right there. What's the requirement? Yeah. I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. How does your soul prosper? This book. Studying this book, knowing this book, learning God's culture, learning God's kingdom. I think a lot of times in the church, people think that all I have to do is sit in the church and I will become a really good Christian. And how many of you know sitting in the church doesn't make you a good Christian? Setting in the church just makes you who you are. Studying the word, spending time with the Lord, being in church will develop you into the mature Christian that God wants you to be. So we come to church to grow, to learn, to <coughs> exhort, to edify, to comfort. That's why we come to church. But it's not enough for you to sit for an hour a week and hear the word. You have to be in this book. Here's one of the problems I, hit, I hear a lot. Well, I, I open the Bible to read it and I don't understand it. Well, here's what I say. Ask God to give you understanding before you read it. And he'll do that. James 1 says, if any of you lack wisdom to ask of God, and he'll give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. All you got to do is ask him. Lord, I'm going to open your book and I'm going to read it, but I need to understand it, so give me wisdom. And he'll give you wisdom. It's the same thing in our giving. God wants to prosper you and abundantly bless you, but you have to learn to walk in his culture. And part of his culture is to have a heart of giving. You bring all the tithes into the storehouse, you give, and God can bless. It's not that God won't bless you if you don't give, but the abundant blessings come as you give because you're sowing seeds into the kingdom. And how many of you know if you sow a seed, you'll get a harvest? If you don't sow a seed, you can't call for a harvest. Amen? 
So we're going to sow seed this morning. And the, re the reason I'm, I'm going to have you come forward is I want you to get a mental picture that I'm investing seed into the kingdom of God. I'm planting seed. And I think sometimes when we pass the buckets, we just kind of go, oh, well, here it goes. And we just throw it in. And we don't put faith with it. So this morning, I'm going to have you bring your tithes to, the, to, the, to us. Give them. The Bible says that on earth, man receives the tithes, but in heaven, God receives them. So every time you give, you're just, God's opening your checking account in heaven, and he's going, okay, another deposit, another deposit. And his interest pays big. Amen. So we're going to give this morning. Are you ready? If you're watching online and you want to give, alife.church is our webpage. You can go there, hit give, go right into the give page. It'll instruct you what, what to do. It's very quick. It's very easy. Or you can just hit shop now on Facebook, and it will also take you into the give page, and you can give. And we encourage you online to give also. You're part of the church. God wants to bless you too. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the opportunity for us to sow into the kingdom of God. I thank you, God, for the abundance that you bring upon us. I thank you, God, that you pour it out. <sighs> in Malachi, you said that it would come on us and overtake us, your blessings. Father, I thank you for that. So, Lord, today we give opportunity for people to sow their tithes and their offerings into the kingdom of God. And I thank you that you are bringing a harvest. And I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you come and you bring your tithes and you put them in here. Play the piano, brother. Thank you, Jesus. Feels good to get up, doesn't it? Okay. Feels good to get up and walk and stretch. And... All right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Here, I'll come to you. How's that? Good morning. Everybody good? All right. Teenagers. Miss Emma. Follow Miss Emma. Go to your class. Teenagers. Shh. Teenagers, go to your class and learn of Jesus. Jonathan, is that me? All right, church, grab your Bibles. Let's go. Did you bring your Bible? I love people that bring their electronics because it's a great way to have your Bible. But I like your Bible because then you can write in it. Thomas, bring me a pen. Somebody stole my pen. Or someone was blessed with my pen. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I have one. Look, I got blessed with one. Well, that's one of our very beginning. Very cool. All right, let's go. Father, I thank you for your word this morning, that it's alive, it's powerful. I thank you, Lord, that as we go into the word, that you... Lord, you take us. And it's not just something that goes into our mind, but Lord, you, you, you go into our heart and, and it's almost like surgery. You open us up and you reveal to us things through the word, things that we're doing right, things that we need to improve on, things that we didn't even realize we should be doing. And Lord, you bring us to a a stronger, mature walk with you. And I thank you that that's what your word does. So as we look at your word this morning, I thank you that you have plowed up the hearts of your people during worship as they lifted up the name of Jesus, as they gave you praise, that that was the plow working on the soil of their heart, digging up that that fallow ground and that stony ground and you were digging it up Lord and you're preparing the heart of flesh to receive the word 
And I thank you for that. So this morning, Lord, as we look into your book, into the word of God, I pray that it will, that it will cause life to rise up inside of us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the love that you demonstrate to us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, God. Thank you for that love. We worship you this morning. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going right back there. This is three weeks in this series that I've started that will teach this whole month. And I want you to see this. How many of you have been cautiously watching the words that have been coming out of your mouth? One of you. Thank you, Carol, for listening. <laughs> Man, I hope more of you have been cautious about the words that are coming out of your mouth. Please correct me. <laughs> I don't want to go to the handheld. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that we may grow thereby. We've been, we've been really focusing on that word desire. What, what is your desire? What's the desire of your life? What is your goal? What do you want to accomplish? You know, I, I love to sit down with people as they're getting ready to get married, and I find it very interesting that most couples, as they prepare for their wedding, will spend hours upon hours upon hours talking, discussing a four-hour event, 45-minute wedding and a three-and-a-half-hour reception. We will spend hours preparing for that four-hour event. And when I ask them, what is your marriage plan? This is what I get from most of them. What? A marriage plan? You want us to have a marriage plan? Well, your marriage is going to last longer than four hours, right? I mean, you're, you're spending all this time preparing for a wedding, but you're taking no time preparing for a marriage. How many have been married longer than 10 years? How many have been married longer than 20 years? 30? Have we been married 30 years? Really? That's all? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that long? Listen, if you don't plan for something, you will hit it every time. In other words, you'll miss the target. And I'm using marriage as just as an example because most people don't plan their marriage. And that's the reason most marriages go separate ways. You know, it, it's amazing to me how many times I hear of people who've been married 20, hello, <laughs> it's good, no problem. It's amazing to me how people have been married 25 and 30 years and then all of a sudden they're getting divorced. Teresa and I are getting ready to head into a whole new experience in our life for the first time. We've been married 33 years, two months, and... 11 days. No, that's, no, not quite hours yet. We're heading up to 
Um, and for the first time in 32 of those years, we are going to have no children in our house. She said to me recently, do you think we'll like each other? <laughs> I said, I said it, it, it's yet to be seen. <laughs> it's a big house. <laughs> it's, 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 we both have realized that if, if we don't make a plan, because we've, al we've always had kids in homes. They've always been there. And we have grandkids that can come to the house, but they don't live with us. So we can't depend upon them to make our house strong. So we're in a new stage in our life to where we're having to look at each other and go, wow, it's just us. We kind of like it, though, you know, I mean, it's, it's been kind of fun, and, and just, you know, it, it's been interesting to, we're not there yet, Isabel's not moving for a couple of weeks, but it's been interesting to, to see what life is going to be like with just the two of us. Desire. Peter said here, and he was talking to baby Christians, listen. He wasn't talking to the mature church. He was talking to baby Christians when he said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you, mo that you may grow here thereby. So what is your desire? That word desire, when I looked it up in the Greek, has two meanings because it can be a very positive uh, meaning, but it can also be very negative. And if you're not careful, the enemy will trick you to cause your desire to get sidetracked and all of a sudden you're looking in the wrong areas for, for happiness and life and, and we're missing the boat. I hear this so much from people. I just want to be happy. Anybody in here ever made that comment? Be honest, show me your hand. You ever said that? I just want to be happy. Stop it. Stop it. Show me in the scriptures where God says, I'm going to give you happiness. He doesn't say that. Because, and here's why, happiness is an emotion. It's a feeling. Have you ever been happy and, and a second later, the happiness is gone because you've been going through something and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where did the happiness go? Why? Because happiness is a feeling. It's an emotion. And we're not supposed to live by our feelings and our emotions. So what do we do? The Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit. So quit looking for happiness and start looking for joy. But see, you can't have joy on your own. You have to combine yourself with the Holy Spirit to walk in joy. And we don't, want, we don't walk in joy because we're not giving ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. But how many of you want joy? Because joy is so much more than happiness. Because happiness is an emotion, it's a feeling, and it can go away that quick. But the joy of the Lord will carry you through the moments of pain and anguish and torment and hurt and, and crises. Joy will carry you through it. Happiness will not. So he says here, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So I really want you to get this picture that it is important for us to desire what God wants you to have. Now, look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. I, I've used these scriptures the last three weeks. We're just going to highlight on these, and then we're going to get into the good teaching. Ephesians 4, 24, 29 says this. Let no, how many of you know what no means? Listen, when you were a kid growing up and your mom said, no cookies, how many did that mean you got? None, None right? Yes. And if you snuck in there and you got any cookies out of the cookie jar, how much trouble were you in? But see, I, I think that believers see this kind of scripture and, and they think this. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth unless your neighbor ticks you off. Then you can let him have it. 
But that's what we do. Right? Is that not what we do? You know, we're holy and religious until someone does something against us. And then we use this term. Well, I am righteously angered. Stop it. There is no righteous anger in that. That is all flesh and you know it. You went back to the grave and dug up the dead man and let him live. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying. Watch this. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Do you realize that what Paul is saying here is that everything that comes out of your mouth needs to edify those around you? Everything. So we go back to that guy when we're on the highway and we're caught in construction zone. Remember that guy? You, you all can relate to that guy. You're either the guy that's sitting in the, in the traffic waiting or you're the guy that's flying up the side trying to get ahead of everyone else. Which one? How many of you are the ones that are on the side trying to get ahead of everyone? That's you. That's Tom. Yeah, that's Thomas. Anybody else want to admit to that? There is he. <laughs> you're in charge. Don't lie. <laughs> But those of you who are setting, who obeyed the laws, the, the, it says, get over now. You got over. And you're in traffic and you're waiting. And the cars aren't moving. And this guy's flying up the side. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Because here's what happened. How many of you have ever yelled at the guy in the car next to you and your kids go, they can't hear you. Do your kids ever do that? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Where is the grace that you're ministering to your children when you're blasting the guy flying down the highway? Or where is the grace, men, that you're ministering to your wife when you're blasting the guy down the highway? And in this day and age, where is the grace, women, that you use when those guys fly by you? I've heard some foul language come out of women's mouths lately. It is amazing to me. When I was a kid, I never heard women cussing. Today, wow. That is... I don't want to kiss that mouth. Come on. Let no. Let no. Say no. no. Look at your neighbor and say no. no. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good for the use of edifying. Do you realize when you come to church there are three things that should happen? You should be comforted, exhorted, and edified. So everything that comes out of your mouth, according to what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 4, is to edify those who can hear you. So let me just ask, how many of us need to have an altar call really quick for what's coming out of our mouths? Anybody? You're forgiven. God saw your hands. You're done. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Let's look at these scriptures. So we got to be careful what comes out of our mouth. But, but watch this. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he says, We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every, say every, every, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Listen, every thought that comes, you cannot stop the thought that comes into your mind. But you can do something once it comes into your mind. The enemy may put it into your brain, but you have to do something with it once it gets there. Once that thought comes into your mind, you must submit it to the obedience to Christ. Take that thought captive and say, Jesus, would I say this if you were standing next to me? Nope, you're gone. I submit that thought to the cross of Jesus Christ, and I call that thought dead right now. 
You won't allow corrupt communication out of your mouth if you learn to bring every thought to the obedient, bring it captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Because if you learn to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, then you have no corrupt communication that will come out of your mouth or out of your fingers on Facebook. Sila, let's just stop and think about Facebook for a moment and how many people like to destroy people on Facebook. How many of you know we would not talk to people in person the way we talk to each other on Facebook? It's like, I want to slap you. <laughs> Stop it. Let no corrupt communication come out of your fingers. Out of your mouth because you can't type it if you haven't thought it. All right, let's go to the next scripture. Now I'm meddling in your business. Look at Romans chapter 10. That's good stuff, though. That'll set you free. Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. Paul says this. What does it say? The word. What's the word? When he's talking about the word, what's he talking about? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. Listen, you can't stop corrupt communication if you don't put this in your head, in your mind. In your, you, you, you've got to meditate on this word. You've got to put it inside of you. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Listen, we got to learn how to walk in faith. That means we got to be careful what we say. Such as, we sneeze one time. I'm getting a cold. What? Because you sneezed? Somebody threw pepper in your nose and now you sneezed and now you're getting a cold. Stop it. Quit taking the things that Satan tries to throw at you. You don't have to have a cold. I haven't had a cold in years. Why? I don't want it. And I'm not going to take it. Why not? Because I'm standing on the word of God. The word says I am healed. How many of you read the scripture that Jesus says, by his stripes, you are healed? How many of you ever read that scripture? How many of you believe it? How many of you let corrupt communication come out of your mouth when it comes to your health? Well, I got to be careful. It's asthma season again. I got to be careful. Allergies are kicking up. Why take it? Do you see the corrupt communication that's coming out of our mouth? So he says here, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we're preaching. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, man, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. That is a great scripture about being born again. How many of you know that? But this is written to the church, so it's not just about people being born again, but it's about what you're confessing out of your mouth. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. So the enemy comes at you tomorrow with the flu. Father, I'm standing here today and I confess that Jesus is Lord over my body and the flu has no right to come against me. So I rebuke the flu in Jesus' name. It cannot come into my house cannot come into my dwelling place. My children will not get the flu. My wife will not get the flu because I confess that Jesus is Lord over my life. But most people have the first sign of the flu and they go, oh man, I, where's the doctor? Doctor, doctor, I need a flu shot. I'm not telling you not to get a flu shot, but I'm telling you we've got to learn how to walk according to the word. Why? Because the hearers around us need to learn how to walk with God. And you are impressing other people by what, come out of, what comes out of your mouth. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's good stuff. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now I'm going to start teaching. That was just all the beginning stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, four through 16. I'm going to get all this in in 25 minutes. 
Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but confess that Jesus is Lord. Next time you want to get into a little tangle with your wife, and I'm not talking about dancing, I'm talking about you know, the, the tangle with your words, with your mate. The next time you get ready to blast them, instead of blasting them, I want you to stop and say, Jesus is Lord of my marriage, and see if that stops the fight. That, that's good stuff right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, it says this. Paul is teaching, and he says, My message and my preaching were not in per persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Listen, church, do you realize that you should be demonstrating the power of God? Let me ask that question again. Do you realize that as a believer, you should be demonstrating the power of God? How many of you knew that? Hold your hand right there and look at Mark chapter 16. I, I didn't give this one to you, Jonathan, so you don't have to throw it up. That's why you need your Bibles, because sometimes I'm going to mess you up. Watch it. Mark chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the church or to the disciples. And he said this, go into all the world, verse 15, and preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and has been baptized shall be saved, and he who disbelieves shall be condemned. These signs shall accompany those who believe. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Show me your hand if you're a believer. Amen. Well, let's put it to the test because it says these signs shall follow. That means that everywhere you go, this should be happening. How many of you know that? <laughs> These signs should be following us. That's what he says. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they shall cast out demons. How many of you are demon caster outers? How many of you even want to deal with a demon? <laughs> We should never be afraid of a demon. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I don't have to worry about a demon. Why? Because Jesus already died on the cross for me, to, to save me, to protect me, to keep me, and he's given me the authority to deal with every demon that comes along. So these signs should be accompanying us. We should be casting out demons. You mean to tell me there are demons? Yes. Yes. And some of them are living in your house. I'm not talking about your husband. I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking about the spirit. That was funny, Thomas. Thomas was like, that's not funny at all. <laughs> I'm talking about spirits that we allow in our house because of what we're confessing out. Let me ask you this. Do you know sickness and disease comes from the devil? That's all I'll say about that one. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. How many of you know you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit for speaking in new tongues? How many of you know that? You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit Speaking in new tongues. Jesus didn't say that it would happen to some of us or only the apostles. He said this is what will happen to those who believe. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to be so signs and wonders will follow you. So look what he said. They will pick up serpents. They, if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Next time your kids get sick... The first thing you should do is not run them to the doctor, but lay hands on them. I rebuke this fever in Jesus' name. I command you to break off of my baby's body. You cannot torment my child any, more, more, any longer. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said these signs will accompany those who believe. Are you a believer? Then these signs should accompany you. 
Well, yeah, but when people get old and die, they have to be sick. Who said you have to be sick to die? I had Earl Johnson in here about two years ago to preach for us. How many remember when Earl Johnson was here? He's my spiritual father. When his mom died, she called all of her kids. And this is what she said to them. I'm dying in three days. If you want to see me, you better come see me. Because I'm going home in three days. That's what she said. I'm going home in three days. In three days, she laid down and took a nap and did not wake up. She was not sick. She went home. Isn't that the way to die? I'm just going to quit living here and I'm going to start living over there. We don't have to be sick. God has given us the authority. That's what we're saying here. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I may not get through all this today. We're going to try though. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So we should be demonstrating the love of God and the power of God. It should be coming out of us. But to come out of us, We've got to understand the kingdom and the culture of God and allow it to flow out of us. That means we've got to deny our flesh and the worldly things. That doesn't mean that you can't be involved in the world because we are. That doesn't mean we need to build a commune and separate ourselves from the world. It means that God needs to be more important than anything else. And our focus is on Him. And if he wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, get up and pray. In fact, it would be good for all of us to start setting a 5 o'clock prayer time. How many of you want to join me for a 5 o'clock prayer time? (laughs) We're not debating the time. We're just talking. How many of you want to pray? we got to say, okay, I'm putting my flesh down, even if it means stealing sleep. Listen, if you can't, Get to the place that you're demonstrating the power and the love of God. Then you need to get up early in the morning and pray. Because it'll start happening in your life. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Matthew chapter 12 verse 34 says this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we're going to demonstrate his love, if we're going to demonstrate his power, if we're going to demonstrate his grace then we've got to have the voice of the Lord coming out of our mouth. Jesus said this, I only speak what my Father tells me to speak. How does he know what the Father wants? He listens. He positions himself to hear from his Father. How many of you ever positioned yourself as a kid to hear from your Father? I know you did, because this is what you did. Your friends or your brother and sisters, whoever you, were, you guys were trying to plan something that was mischievous, one of you stood over here to listen. Listen to Dad. If Dad's coming, tell us. You positioned yourself to hear his voice. Now, you did that so you could do something ornery or mean, but we need to learn how to position ourselves to hear his voice in the good way. And so instead of getting over here in caught up in all the stuff in the world, I'm going to position myself into the voice of God. I'm going to position myself in the voice of God. We were studying on Wednesday night the story where Jesus walked on water. How many remember that story? One of the things that happened before he walked on the water, the Bible says that he separated himself. He sent the disciples away. He sent the crowd away. And he went up onto the mountain and prayed. He positioned himself to hear from the Father. And church, we've got to learn to position ourselves to hear from the Father so we can demonstrate his spirit and his power. Look at the next verse, verse 5. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. See, we're trying to build our faith here. We're trying to believe God for miracles in our life. We're trying to believe God for our gym to be rebuilt because we've got a bad roof. And we need about $35,000. But we're trying to figure out how to do it by raising money. Well, let's have a burrito sale. How many burritos you got to sell to raise $35,000? Yeah. 
about 35,000 burritos. Yeah. So why not position ourselves in the voice of God and hear what God says on how to get that money? So we've got to learn how to position ourselves because we're, we're, my, 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 my message, my preaching, we're not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and in power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. We depend too much on the wisdom of man. Constantly. Constantly we're looking to man for wisdom. Constantly. I hear people say this to me. You know what my horoscope said this morning? You're what? You're what? You're reading what? Oh, it's just for fun. Really? I don't think Satan thinks it's fun. He's after you. But we do things like we do things that are that are not godly. And we're okay with it. We, 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 Teresa and I were watching a show the other day on TV, and, 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 and it was like, oh my, oh my goodness. I can't believe that they said that. Do you know that TV has no filters now? That was, I was a kid growing up. You couldn't say anything. They couldn't cuss. There was a time that, that on TV, they didn't even have married couples in the same bed. Ricky and Lucy lived in, they had twin beds. You know, TV used to have some standards. Today, there's no standards. And you've got to be able to go, I think I need to turn that off. You've got to watch. We've got to look. Because what you're putting into this is what is going to come out of this. And if you want to demonstrate the power and the grace of God, you've got to put more God in than you do the world. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. The word power means this, the inerrant power. Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Now, let me ask you a question. If, if I happen to have had a grenade here this morning and I pulled the pin out of that grenade, what would you do? Well, pray for me. No, I'm going to give it to you. Oh, you're gone. You're gone. Why are you gone? Because you know what power is in that thing. Listen, the world needs to know what kind of power is in us. They need to know what kind of power is in us. The world needs to know who to call when their family is sick. And we need to be ready to walk into, that, into those rooms and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. How many of you are ready to pray for the sick? See, that's your first step of faith. I'm ready. I'm going to do it. I'm going to start praying for sick. But what if it doesn't happen? You're practicing. Do it anyway. Well, what if it doesn't happen? It's on God, not you. You go pray the prayer of faith. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to the voice of God. He'll tell you who to pray for. You don't have to just go running around praying for everybody. That's where people get into trouble. Remember in, in Acts chapter 3, I think it's 3, maybe it's 4, where John and uh, Peter and James, Peter and James went to the, the temple to pray. And that day when they was going through, they saw the blind man sitting there begging. And they healed him of his blindness. Remember that story? Do you know how many times Jesus walked by that man and never prayed for him? You ever thought about that? Jesus went into the temple multiple times, and that man sat right there on that gate, and Jesus never prayed for him. Why? Because the Father didn't tell him to do it. See, we've got to be ready to pray, because when the Father tells us to pray, healing will come. Then it's on him. But too many times we're running around, I'm just going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. If God didn't tell you to pray for that person, don't pray for him. That's a good word of wisdom right there. So power means the power residing in a thing. What power is residing inside of you? Power of God. It should be. Is it? Yes, it is. If you've been born again, the power is in you. 
now you must demonstrate his power and his grace. Look at verse 6. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Listen, God has wisdom for you. It's going to come as you ask him. Father, I need wisdom on this situation. I need you to help me in this situation. Give me wisdom. You said in your word, if any of us lack wisdom to ask of you, you'd give it to it, give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And because we don't ask God for wisdom, then we get caught in this situation and we're a double-minded man in this situation. And the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. How many of you want to be unstable? Nobody wants to be unstable. So we got to learn to get the wisdom of God about the situation. Lord, what do you want me to do now? Where do you want me to go now? How do you want me to do this? I've got a, a, a patient that I've been dealing with, and the first time I went in to deal with him, um, he didn't want to talk to me because I walked into his place as a chaplain and he didn't want to talk to me and and we stood there for about three minutes I was sat there he was on his bed and I was sitting in a chair and for about three minutes it was just a real awkward silence anybody ever been in that awkward silent place not a fun place huh I'm talking I'm trying to talk to him I'm trying to drum up a conversation and and he knows I'm a chaplain he knows I'm there to talk to him about his spiritual life and he's not moving and so I'm praying the whole, while we're talking, I'm praying and going, God, you've got to give me something that breaks the ice to where we can talk. And as I'm looking, the Lord just, I mean, just looked, turned my head and I looked at this deal over here and went, saw an object, and I turned to him and I said, did you used to? And his eyes lit up and he went, oh, what do you know about that? Had to do with motorcycles. And I said, well, my son's a biker. Really? Yeah, he's in a motorcycle club. He started asking all these questions, and the ice broke. And the ice broke. Because I asked God for wisdom. Then they tell me the patient's going to die. I mean, they, they called me and said, you got to come, he's going to die. So I go in, he, I ask him, you want me to pray for you? And he said, yeah. And that's what I prayed. Lord, open his lungs up, open his air passages so he can breathe. That's all I prayed. He told me the next day, they said he's going to die. He probably won't make it through the night. The next day, he told me a week later, he told me, he said, the next day, he said, when I woke up, I could breathe better than I've been able to breathe in months and months and months. And this is what he said. How can I deny God when he's done what he's done in my body? Why? Not, not me. I'm demonstrating the power of God. But see, you can do the same thing. It's the wisdom that God has for you. All you got to do is ask. But when we allow corrupt communication to come out of our mouth, James says that bitter and sweet cannot come out of the same faucet. Bitter and sweet cannot come out of the same faucet. So we can't have corrupt communication coming out of our mouth and the demonstration of God's power coming out of our mouth. One will override the other. And what will override is the one that we give strength to. So as the body of Christ, we need to give strength to the power of God so we can demonstrate the power of God. So in other words, we've got to be in the word, we've got to be in prayer, we've got to be in church, I ran into a situation yesterday. Teresa and I were at this place, and, and, and I asked this guy, I said, somebody told me you'd come clean my pool. And he said, for how much? I said, oh, no, he said you'd do it free. I was joking with him. And he went, what? Free? And I said, oh, just come over and clean my pool. I'll cook you a steak. And he went, you'll cook me a steak? I said, yeah. So in a few minutes, I said to him, I said, where do you go to church? And he goes, I don't, I don't go to church. 
I looked at him and I said, your grandma took you to church. I know she did. And his eyes got big. He's like, yeah, she did. And I said, you need to go to church. And here's what he said. He said, you know, I've determined that I can know God just as well by myself. I don't have to go to church. So I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit to say, okay, Lord, what do I tell him? Here's what the Holy Spirit told me, and this is what I said to him. I said, you know what? I could eat a steak all by myself, but it's a lot more fun when I have a lot of people around me. And he went, oh, you got me there. <laughs> he said, I guess I'm coming to church. So he'll be here. And I'm like, listen, what are we doing? We're demonstrating the power of God. But we can only do it when our mouth and the communication out of our mouth is pleasing to God because God won't allow corrupt communication and his power to flow together. And corrupt communication is fear and doubt. We got to learn how to walk in the faith of God. Amen. All right, I'll quit there. I'll pick up next week right there. Let's pray. I hope you've been blessed. I hope this fed you. I hope you're ready to grow in the things of God. And I hope you're ready to demonstrate the power of God. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that your word causes us to become alive. Your word is simple. So we lay it out simple, Lord. We need to be in prayer. We need to be studiers of the word. We need to come together in fellowship together and to know each other. And to hear the word, to encourage, to exhort, to edify. Lord, I pray that in this house, that each person that is listening, whether they're sitting here or they're online, each person in this house will be overtaken with the desire to demonstrate the love of God, to demonstrate the grace of God, to demonstrate the power of God. Lord, that we will be overtaken with the desire to stop the, the corrupt communication, the communication of fear and doubt. But Lord, we will allow to what comes out of our mouth is that we are confessing that Jesus is Lord. Father, allow that to begin to grow inside of us. And Lord, I realize that we fail, and I realize, Lord, that we mess up, we make mistakes, and I thank you that your grace is sufficient enough to carry us through our mistakes, our sins, and our failures. I thank you for that. But Lord, I also thank you that your power and your love is big enough to cause us to grow in strength and no longer need the milk of the word, but we desire the meat of the word that we begin to grow in power. And Lord, I pray that you will make this house a lighthouse for this city. Lord, that when people are hurting and they're sick and they're dying and they're, and they're mentally uh, uh, messed up, they're, they're possessed by demons, Lord, they're tormented by demons, that they will know that there is a lighthouse here and they will run to these people and these people will demonstrate your power and your love father do something in our heart this morning do something in our heart to stir us up i'm reminded of what paul says to timothy stir up the gifts of god that is inside of you that was placed there by the laying on of hands of the presbytery lord i pray that you will stir up the gifts that's in each person this morning let those gifts that have laid, laid dormant, stir them up. Prophecy and grace and mercy and, and, and compassion and, and, and tongues and interpretation and healings and miracles. Stir those gifts up inside of us, God. Father, that we learn to function and demonstrate your power and your grace and your love. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning, God that you're doing a work here at Abundant Life and you're calling us out of mediocrity and you're calling us into a place of anointing and power by the Holy Spirit. Father, we worship you this morning. Church, just worship the Lord. Take a moment and just lift your hands to the Lord and give him thanks for the love that he's given to you. Give him thanks for his love. Give him thanks. God, I love you this morning. And thank you that you have demonstrated your love to me. Give him thanks, church.
Father, I thank you that you are causing me to no longer to just be a, a, a baby drinking milk, but you're causing me to grow up. You're giving me a new desire for the word, a new desire for prayer, a new desire for the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you that you're calling us into a place of repentance, a place of consecration, a place, Lord, where we stand before you pure and holy and righteous. Lord, I thank you that we truly are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I thank you that we truly are holy because of the blood of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that we are healed. We've been delivered from every sin, every bondage, every failure, every hurt, every abandonment, every abuse. We've been delivered, Lord. And you're delivering us now from those things. Father, I thank you that you're our provider. I thank you that you're our healer. I thank you that you're our shepherd and that you guide us and lead us and keep us safe. I thank you that you're our peace. You are Jehovah, our peace. I thank you that you are our banner. Your word says that your banner over us is love. And you are our banner. You keep us from the storms. You guide us. You guard us. You protect us. No evil shall befall you. You said, Father, that even if we were to dash our foot against the stone, that the angels would remove the stone. Lord, I thank you that you said that if the arrow comes against us one ways, that it will go away from us seven ways. Lord, I thank you that you are causing us to have a desire, a depth, a hunger to abide in your presence, to find that secret place, Lord, where we are alone with you, to where we, we, we take ourselves away from the cares of the world, from the moment of the world, and we put ourselves in your presence. We position ourselves, even as Moses did when he climbed the mountain, as Jesus did when he separated himself, as Daniel did in the lion's den, as the Hebrew children did in the fiery furnace. They positioned themselves in your presence. Father, cause us to have a depth of desire to position ourselves in your, in your presence, God. We can truly pray as Paul prayed and declare as Paul declared that you have caused us to come and set with you in heavenly places. And not when we die and go to heaven, but even now we can set with you in heavenly places and learn and hear your voice. And you said in your word, Father, that my sheep know my voice and no other voice will they hear. And Father, I thank you that you are developing that in us. I thank you, God, that the desire to know you is stronger than any other desire in our heart. And you're developing that, God. I thank you, Father. Lord, we love you this morning. And Lord, I pray for anyone in this house that has, that has drifted away from you. They're that one, they're that out of that 90, that 100 sheep, Lord, they, 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 they've kind of drifted from the foe. And I pray, Father, with your loving, gentle hand that you'll wrap your arm around them and pull them back into your foe because I know you'll do it even now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Lord, we love you this morning and thank you that your love has been demonstrated to us today. I love you, Jesus. We worship you, God. We praise you. Holy Spirit, we praise you. Thank you, Lord God. We adore you, Father. We exalt you today. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We love you, God. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth but only that which is edifying to those who hear, that they know the grace of God. Help us to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Father, we worship you. We honor you, Lord. You are holy, and we give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If the Holy Spirit has tugged on your heart this morning, 
and, and you feel like, Lord, I, I'm making a fresh commitment to you, please share that with somebody before you leave this morning. Tell somebody, I made a fresh commitment to draw closer to Jesus. I made a fresh commitment to allow my desires to become his desires. Tell somebody that this morning before you go. If you're online, please let us know. Drop us a note right there on, online and say, my desire is to know Jesus. Take a moment if you're online. If you're online, please let us know you're there. It's important that we know you're there. We want to be in agreement with you in prayer, but we have to know you're there. Teresa and I want each of you to know that we love you so much. But even more important than that, the love of the Father is available to you. And he cares so much about you. Thank you, Lord, that you are causing a stirring in our hearts today. And we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Go demonstrate the power of Jesus to the world. Go be salt. Go be light. And before you leave, if you're new, please get a Connect card back there with Tom and fill that out so we know who you are because we want to connect with you. Amen. If you ordered a food box, you can begin to make your way to the food room. I'll be right in there. And then if you're going to be part of the follow-up, a, follow a meeting right now, starting right up here in the front. God bless you. We love you. And I will see you Wednesday night right here. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Every blessing you pour out. Blessed be.